Welcome back to Cherry Beckert's Technology Podcast. I'm Megan Hutchinson, a tax partner in Cherry Beckert's Technology Group, and I'm joined once again by Lauren Stinson and Don King from our sales and use tax practice. This episode is part two in a short series we're presenting on state and local tax for technology companies. So if you haven't listened to part one, give that a listen. In our previous podcast, Lauren and Don reviewed the pitfalls of not properly reporting for sales and use tax and important items for tech companies to watch out for. Today, I sit down with them to talk about some best practices and how to actually help your company become compliant when it comes to its sales and use tax obligations. Lauren and Don, welcome back. Nice Thanks, back. Megan. Um, I'd like to start to start our discussion with you, Lauren. Um, the tax laws have been changing pretty rapidly. What have you seen in the past year and predict looking forward to 2023? Yeah, this has been a really hot area, especially for technology companies. And over the last year or so, there's been um, at least a dozen states that have introduced legislation to start taxing digital products and services. So, you know, while there wasn't that many states that introduced new legislation, it, it was introduced. Um, so I think we will start seeing a lot more states that previously did not tax, you know, digital goods or you know, cloud-based software start to tax that um, as they look at different ways to uh, raise more revenue and capture, you know, capture a lot of what's going on just, you know, in the world with technology products. Um, kind of a big issue last year was Maryland. They did a, a year, the year before they started taxing uh, digital software. And then a year later, less than a year later, they carved out a business exemption. So they were kind of in and out pretty quickly. Um, and then we're also going to, I think we're going to start seeing a lot of you know, class action lawsuits. We saw it happen with Peloton where you know, companies are not charging sales tax and they have a class action lawsuit you know, because they're not collecting tax where they should be or they're over collecting when they shouldn't be. So you know, it's really important that companies are very mindful of you know, what their sales tax obligations are and doing their best to be spot on with you know, where they're, where they're cl collecting. Right. You know, and then just kind of one, one last, um, tidbit is just with you know, new products and services like NFTs. You know, these are something that I don't think a lot of us really even understood a couple of years ago. You know, states are really starting to take a look at taxing those. So just a lot of movement in this area towards you know, more taxation. Right. So Don, once a company understands that it has sales tax obligations and you know likely has for many years, What's the best way for them to handle that exposure? Yeah, Megan, there's a few different ways. I mean, as we talked about Nexus reviews in the past uh, podcast, once you determine you have Nexus for the jurisdiction, you have that responsibility to register and collect and remit tax going forward, you need to you know, try to figure out where you need to register, when you need to register, and how you need to register. And what I mean by that is, you have to take a look at your exposure for those past liabilities. Determine when that nexus began. Was it five years ago? Was it two years ago, one year? Then we have to determine whether or not you need to register based on those periods. But based on that liability, the potential exposure you have, you need to make a determination of how do you want to handle those past uh, liabilities. Now, there's a way of doing it through a VDA, a voluntary disclosure agreement, where you work with the state to uh, and negotiate with them on what periods would be covered uh, within the tax exposure uh, liability periods, I guess. But you would you would try to set up, a, let's say your exposure was eight years ago over the course of the entire eight years. You could potentially get a VDA that's a three-year look back or a four-year look back, which would shorten that period. You can get penalties potentially waived. You potentially get some interest waived. It depends on the jurisdiction. But there's ways of being able to reduce your exposure or your liability. Another way of doing it is registering and, and filing past due returns and, and requesting penalties to be waived as well. Um, the one thing about that, uh, the other thing, I guess, you can go register going forward. If you think your liability is not large enough, 
you can register go forward. But what that does, it leaves you open to potential risk because of statute of limitations. Um, the statute remains open on periods that you have not been filing tax returns. And what I mean by that is once you file a tax return, that period closes when the statute expires. So if three years from now and you have a three year limitation, that return, those returns have been filed for three years, your statute of limitations has you know, expired on those periods and, they, and the state can't go beyond them. But if you have open periods where you haven't been filing, the statute continues to run and states can access into those. So it's best to get those returns filed. And like I said, either VDA found the past due returns um, and making sure that your risk is limited and you don't have to run with that uh, for potential, you know, potential issues in the future for reserves or anything like that. I would probably want to caution any, you know, any tech company that thinks, oh, well, you know what, I'm just going to start, you know, I'm going to not worry about the past and just start registering today because the states are, you know, they're they're pretty savvy and they know that if if you've just started registr registering and collecting tax today, there's a good chance that you have should have been doing it in the past and we'll send you an, a nice little audit um, not notice. Right. Um, what about if you're making tax exempt sales to, to wholesalers? Lauren, what, what, what about those? Yeah, that, that's a great question because a lot of companies think, oh, well, I'm not making any sales. All my sales are exempt from tax. I don't have to worry about you know, all the sales tax obligations. And unfortunately, that um, couldn't be farther from the truth. So if you are a company and you are making sales um, where your purchaser is exempt, maybe under a resale exemption, then it's your obligation to collect exemption certificate documentation to be able to prove that that sale should not have had tax collected. So this is a very easy way for auditors to um, build some build some large audit assessments because they're going to when they when a company gets audited if they don't have exemption certificate paperwork to document all the exempt sales they will be assessed tax so we strongly recommend if you are making exempt sales don't just ignore your sales tax obligation make sure you're collecting all the proper exemption certificates and make sure that they are proper and valid and you're not expired if they have those exemption certificates are they still required to file a sales tax report or does having those certificates cover their base there are some states that will that do have a provision that if all your sales are exempt wholesale sales you don't have a filing requirement but most states will still require you to be registered and filing um you know, in this case, zero tax returns, zero dollar tax due returns. Yeah, Lauren, let me throw a little bit extra in there, just a, a suggestion for those that are listening. Your exemption certificates, I'm an ex-auditor, I've been a consultant, and I've been on the corporate side. And the main thing that you need to do is not just get the exemption certificates, but I would suggest maintaining them in a centralized place where they're easy to access. I would make sure that you have them like Lauren said, document it properly, but make sure that your AR system is set up or the, the customer's accounts are properly coded as exempt taxable, but make sure you have that cert on hand in order for that to occur so you don't have that risk of a liability. And having them in a centralized place makes them easier for audits when they do occur. Um, you can pull them out and, and easily present them the auditor instead of having to track them down and find them and then have to go out and collect them because you can't find them. Yeah, good point. Um, Don, what what about if you're selling, let's say through a marketplace, does that impact how the company would look at sales tax? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, marketplace facilitators, states have been really aggressive with them over the past few years. Uh, the states would rather collect tax from one source then have to go to multiple sources and so what they've done is a lot all the states now have put in place marketplace facilitator rules that the facilitator is responsible for the collection or remittance of tax for the seller and what i mean by that is if if you sell through a marketplace like amazon if you are selling your products you are the marketplace seller 
Amazon being the facilitator. Amazon would collect the tax, remit the tax on your sales. Usually what happens in that situation is it's not a buy sell transaction. It's more of an agency arrangement. So it is still your sale. Um, you, you realize in that situation, you may not have the sales tax remittance that you have to make, but you also have potential other risks that you have to deal with. An example of that would be that in Washington state, you may have B&O tax liability because that is still your sale. Uh, Amazon will not report that as B&O tax on their sales of your product uh, through a marketplace. So you just have to be careful that you have potential other risks that come in gross receipts tax, uh, potentially income tax, if those are truly your sales that they are, are being made through the uh, marketplace. What about technology um, for these technology companies? What technology is out there to help them with all of these challenges? Yeah, there's um, you know, there are a lot of great technology solutions like Avalara, Vertex, um, Sovos, OneSource. You know, there's all sorts of different en tax engines that will help simplify sales tax collection. So if you think about it, um, you've got your billing system or your shopping cart. And where this tax technology fits in is that it bolts on and integrates with your you know, accounting software or a shopping cart. So then when a transaction runs through, it can go into the sales tax engine cloud, get the right rate for the right jurisdiction for the right product type to be able to pull down the correct um, correct sales tax rate. But the key is, is that, you know, as your business evolves, so does your tax, you know, you're the, the formatting of and the configuration of your tax technology. So it's not a set it and forget it. It's very important that you keep your eyes on that technology. Just so as you get nexus in new states where you've crossed economic nexus thresholds or you have new employees, that you're turning on that technology so that you know that technology solution knows, okay, I need to collect tax in this new state. Or when you have new products and services to make sure they're prop properly mapped to the right product tax code. So the, again, so tax can be um, you know, calculated correctly. So you know, tax technology is great as long as it's properly maintained. Yeah, a lot of that also, you, when you're setting that up, don't think of just the current, think of the future. Um, if there are changes like Lauren said that come through, make sure you can make those adjustments on the run instead of having to reconstruct what you've uh, put in place. Very good. Well, um, guys, what is one main takeaway that you would like our audience to know before we wrap up here today? Um, yeah, I, I can take that one. You know, just really know that sales sales tax is very complicated. And, you know, for a lot of companies, this is not something that you want to DIY it. You know, understanding your product taxability, nexus, um, systems, you know, it's very nuanced and very complicated. Um, and, you know, not something that you should necessarily tackle alone. So we've got a great, you know, great sales and use tax team here with a broad base of knowledge, deep expertise, then we're happy to help guide you through all their sales, all the sales tax challenges that you face. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks once again, Lauren, Dawn, thank you for your time and sharing all of your knowledge here. We invite our audience to check back soon as we continue this series covering the tax matters that are specific to technology companies in this realm. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks, Megan. Thank you.